everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. I feel that my placement after Aja in the program was very strategic. <laughs> I, I recently met an extremely pr proud quadcopter owner. He wouldn't stop droning on about it. <laughs> 30 minutes of this, folks. <laughs> Uh, so I just want to say happy Friday, woo! Uh, it's actually Monday. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to be here at Cascadia. I'm speaking here for the first time. This is my first uh, full length talk here and I need to move it along because I have 229 slides. But uh, this is very exciting. Um, like, I was researching, like, what the conference is about and what I should talk about, and it's really exciting that there's, like, a, a conference that's all about uh, waterfall development. Uh, <laughs> I really like, I really enjoy waterfall development, because if you've ever been in a waterfall, you'll know that it's, like, super comfortable. And there's a lot of really neat, neat waterfalls, especially in movies like Jurassic Park. And you, I really like that movie, too, because they have eunuchs in there, and you can, like... <laughs> I love that. I love this movie. It's so good. Anyway, also, I really like, I really, really like uh, waterfall development because Gantt charts are amazing. I mean, look at this thing. You can tell, like, you can tell that stuff is happening in here. I mean, look at that. That is awesome. I mean, you can tell. You can tell something is happening, that, pro that progress. And the thing is, like, I really, really don't like extreme programming, and I'll tell you why. One of the reasons is, like, the name of it, that really pisses me off. Look at that. Why is the X big? XP, that doesn't make any, sp that doesn't make sense. Just spell it right, seriously. Like, it should be EP. The other problem with it is it's totally extreme, so whenever I'm doing programming, I gotta wear my official extreme programming helmet, because I don't want to get hurt while I'm doing development, so I feel like, well, this is why I'm really excited to be at a waterfall development conference, because I just really want to slow things down. So, uh, I was checking out the conference website and uh, taking a look at it, and I thought it was really cool. Uh, so I, I checked out <laughs> I checked out the source of the web page, and I thought this is cool. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but they use CSS, which stands for Cascadia Style Sheets. Uh, <laughs> so I was really inspired by the talks earlier today. Like, I, I want all right, everybody. What time is it? Tell me what time it is. No, it is business. It is business time. <laughs> That's how I answered it. Nobody else seemed to answer it that way. Anyway, I thought that talk was really, really, really exciting. And then I thought about Han unification. He didn't even touch on that. Like, for, take a look at these. So those characters are all the same. Each column are the same characters. This is Han unification. For Unicode, they took these, took these characters and glommed them into one, so each row has one, one code point. But what I thought was really interesting about Han unification is, if you're taking all these characters and turning them into one character, does that mean it's actually a Han Solo? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll do something productive, I promise. Anyway, so this talk will be extremely boring, so I hope you find it to be awesome. <laughs> so I, I was really worried about I was really worried about whether or not people would like this talk, so I put a bird on it. <laughs> I don't know why anybody hasn't made any Portlandian jokes yet, <laughs> but I guess that's because Portlanders don't like reality TV. <laughs> Did I mention I'm from Seattle? <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. I'm on the Ruby core team and the Rails core team. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter as Tenderlove. I'm also on GitHub as Tenderlove. Instagram as Tenderlove. And I'm also on Yo as Tenderlove. So if you want to contact me there, you can send me some Yo's. Um, I'm the number one contributor, number one Rails contributor. I have a lot of internet points there. That's a lot of internet points. But I'm going to give you all the, this is the secret to getting a lot of internet points, okay? Are you, you guys all listening to the secret? This is the secret. The secret, revert commits count to. <laughs> 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 so more mistakes equals more points, so 
go forth, <laughs> you know how to win. <laughs> anyway, I'm a short stack engineer. Uh, I enjoy pair programming. This is a close up shot, action shot of pair programming. Um, hard part about setting this up is that the TTY is kind of sticky. Uh, I have a cat, his name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse. Uh, I have another cat, her name is SeaTac Airport YouTube. Um, this, is, this is a close up shot of her. So my wife said that we had to get two cats so that um, I would stop looking at pictures of cats on the internet. <laughs> but she, <laughs> what she didn't realize is that's just not how it works. Now we have, we have two cats and I look at a picture of cats on the internet. Anyway, this is my other cat in her natural ha habitat on top of my laptop. Um, recently I've been getting into Node.js and that's so that I can be closer to the metal. So I, like this is me, this, I'm getting close to the metal there, <laughs> super close. Uh, I have my own consulting company. <clears throat> dur, 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 dur. This is adequate, adequate. We do everything adequately. I'm trying to come up with a new logo and music, but this is good enough, I think. <laughs> Uh, recently, recently we've been working on a lot of groundbreaking, te brown, uh, groundbreaking technology. Uh, this, um, <laughs> we break a lot of ground with that. <laughs> uh, actually, we've got a website called RecruiterSpam.com. Uh, you should check out this website. We are collecting data for lulls. Uh, and I want to talk. So I want to talk a little bit about Markov chains. So what Markov chains are is if you take a corpus of something, say email, unwanted emails from recruiters, you can build a Markov chain out of these things. And what Markov chains are for is taking a bunch of text and turning it into something new. Like, so you have a giant corpus, and you start, out, you start out with this corpus of text, and you say, I want to generate something new from this using the patterns involved here. So we're going to look at how to do, look at how to do Markov chains. So let's say this is our corpus. Uh, just some sample data. What, what we do is we parse this and turn it into a tree that looks something like this. And uh, these are the different nodes. The nodes are the words, and the edges on each node is the probability that we'll move from one, one word to the next. So if you're on node I, you have a 25% chance of going to tender or a 75% chance of going to love. Uh, and when we generate new text, what we do is we start out on a node, calculate, we choose, like, grab a random number and figure out where we should go, go next based on these particular weights. So we can come up with new sentences based on this uh, particular graph. So this new sentence that we might come up with from that particular corpus was, I tender love you too, even though that sentence didn't exist in the original corpus as a brand new one. So what I actually store in the data is I store occurrence accounts, or occurrence counts, so the edges are actually the number of times I've seen I go to tender or I go to love. So I saw that transition three times. And if you look at the data in Ruby, it looks like this is the data structure that I use in Ruby. So it's just you know, a hash. The key is that, that starting node and the values are where it could possibly end up with their counts. And taking the recruiter data that I have or the recruiter emails that I have, this is, this is a sample of the real data that I have. In the, the thicker the line is, the higher probability that it'll go from one node to the next. So basically what we have to do is whenever we're at one of these nodes, we have to pick a random child to go to next. And I want to talk a little bit about picking random children. And the way that I do that is using a, using a binary heap. And what a binary heap looks like is it looks like a tree data structure like this. It's a, it's a binary tree, and the properties of this tree are that each node has two children. The tree is complete, meaning that we always have uh, all the children are always filled, unless it's the very bottom row where maybe only one of them is filled, but the next one that we add will fill it, or the next node that we add will fill it. Uh, the, each node is greater than or equal to its uh, children. Or you can do a binary heap in the opposite direction and flip that, flip that conditional, but in this one I'm saying each node is greater than or equal to its children. Uh, so let's say we want to add a new node to this. The way that we would do that is let's say we're adding a 15, uh, that 15 is too big, it's bigger than the 8, so the algorithm for adding this is we swap the two, and then 15 is still bigger than 11, so this breaks our rules, so we swap those two, and now our tree is where we want it to be. So if we look at the heap for transitioning from i, we want to we choose different nodes based off of i. If we look at the heap for that, this is what the heap looks like. 
So love is the top. That's the, that is the, uh, the highest probability that we'll go to. And you can see each of these counts represents the weight for that particular node. So the way that we select one of these using a, heap, a binary heap is that we take a journey of love. So what we do is we pretend that that particular heap or that heap is like a road that we're driving on and we're driving a car and our car is going to, our car is going to land on one of those particular nodes. So we calculate the total trip cost, which is the total cost of all the nodes, and we generate a random number between zero and that, that total cost or that top cost. And we call that, we say we have a random amount of gas. We see how far that gas gets us. And wherever we land, that's what, our, that's what our random child is going to be. So this is what it would look like in practice. I like to imagine that, so we have our trip total cost of seven. We generated a random amount of gas. We have a uh, kit here going on a date. Uh, and he's a very irresponsible dater, so he fills his tank up with a random amount of gas. And then he walks along here. So we start out, we start out with six. At the top one, we subtract three, visiting that node. We go down one, we subtract one, our gas is two. Down one, our gas is one. We go back over here, keep walking, because we still have gas. Now our gas is zero. And that's the random child that we go to. So we'll stop in a different place depending on how much gas we filled the car with. What I think is really cool about this data structure is that we can store a heap in an array. So let's say we have our heap that looks like this. If we move all these nodes such that they're next to each other, we can actually store it in an array that looks like this. So if we were to transition that, that's what it would look like if all the nodes were lined up next to each other. And what's really interesting about this is that we can then calculate our parents and our children using uh, the index of the array. So we say the index divided by two is the parent. And two times the index is the child, two times the index plus one is the other child. And the only way this math actually works out is if that nil is at the beginning there. So it has to be a one-based array. So let's say we're here at the very top. Our index is one. Uh, we multiply that by two. And that means that the children is at index two and index three. Or let's say we're down here at, um, we're at index three and we want to calculate the parents. So we say three divided by two. Well, that's one because uh, we're doing integer arithmetic in Ruby. If we were doing floats, you would have to floor this. Anyway, so. The output of this, you can see the output of this uh, Markov chain generation at Horse Recruiter. Uh, I would have to, I, this isn't complete without some stuff. I'm not gonna read these out loud. These are some of the ones that I liked. Humor if you are receiving LinkedIn. Uh, this one's my personal favorite, Bauer. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, now on to the actual stuff, which I, am, I will have to hurry. So I'm gonna talk about speeding up your code, speeding up Rails. Uh, we're going to look at a bunch of benchmarking, benchmarking libraries, and we're also going to look at how I use these benchmarking libraries to speed up Rails, how you can use those benchmarking libraries to speed up your code as well. But first, I want to talk about some stuff that's on my mind. I spend a lot of my time thinking about weird stuff and things that annoy me, if you can't tell from my previous slides. Like, for example, people always say this, like, separation of concerns, and this really, really bothers me. And, the, it's not for a good reason. The only reason it bothers me is because I think of this face doing this. And I'm like, how does this have anything to do with anything? All I think about is two concerned faces getting separated. I can't focus on what, what is going on. So whenever anyone says separation, oh, separation of concerns, I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay, move on. Anyway, so let's talk about some pro tips. Uh, Ruby-D, does anyone use Ruby-D? One person. Well, you should use Ruby dash D, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how to use it. Just tack on dash D. And the reason I really, really, really like Ruby dash D is because it'll print out, it puts Ruby into debugging mode, and it prints out anywhere that an exception was raised. So this is very handy if an exception gets swallowed. So if you're seeing some weird exception get bubbled up and you don't know where that came from, you go to the code, it's not actually coming from there, you, run, you can run the program with Ruby-D and you'll see these debug errors come out or these debug lines come out that say, hey, an exception occurred at this particular, this particular line and you can go check that one out. It prints them out regardless of where they came from. So you can find solid exceptions. Uh, that's just one thing I've been using for debugging. The other thing I've been thinking about recently is Rack. And I wanna say, like, so Rack, it's over. <laughs> Reality TV. 
<laughs> I am a jerk, sorry. Anyway, so <laughs> Rack has this, this is the Rack interface. Hopefully most of you are familiar with the Rack interface. You have to implement a method called call, which takes this environment hash, and then you can, you proxy this environment hash down to other, other Rack middlewares, and you have to return up an array back up the stack. And what really, really annoys me is that the only way you can pass data between your Rack middlewares is, guess what, this LOL global data. Let's just shove crap in our hash. That really, really bothers me. Really bothers me about the Rack API. But also, I need to say something like, I, oh, I should have mentioned I'm on the Rack core team as well. Um, so there will be no Rack 2.0 uh, star. There will be a Rack 2.0. Um, but probably I want to release a Rack gem that's 2.0. There may not be a Rack spec that's 2.0, although I want there to be a Rack spec that's 2.0. So I'm thinking, like, for a Rack 2.0, I want to do something like drop Ruby 186. I feel like maybe we don't need to support that anymore. So go to something that's maybe greater than or equal to a Ruby 2.0, but of course we can only do that in a major version, and Rack is already at one, so obviously there has to be a Rack 2.0. But I've been thinking a lot about the next generation of web servers and uh, this, type of, this type of protocol that we need, to, we need to have in order to move forward. And that's, I want, I want something like this. Like, I want, I want a Rack spec that looks something like this, where basically we have an environment hash, which is just a CGI environment, uh, and we have an input and output stream where input is the post body and it can't be rewound. So anytime you need to take, take data, like say somebody's uploading file or they're doing a form post, we read off of this I.O. And the output, the output I.O. is just an I.O.-ish type thing where we can write stuff to it or set headers, but it seems it, it's very similar to an I.O. And what's cool about that is the web server, if it wants to, they can, they can wrap up that I.O. and provide something to you that actually chunks stuff back out to the socket. Um, the goal of this for me is basically to steal from Node. Um, just because one thing that really annoys me about Node is people are like, oh, I'll look at all the stuff that Node can do. Ruby sucks, it can't do that. We can totally do that. We just don't have the APIs. I want to steal and do that. So these are just my thoughts. Um, if you have, like, these are random thoughts that I just want to write down and share with people. If you have thoughts about this, please come talk to me about it. Um, we need to push, for, push Rack forward. We need to make the Ruby web server space even better than it is today. Uh, and the only way that we can do that is improving these, this API. So on to performance tools. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of performance tools, gathering data from Rails applications, uh, what we're doing on... I keep saying we, whenever I say we, just G sub that in your mind to I. It is me doing it. <laughs> there is no we. I also think that's weird when people are like, oh, just report that bug to the such and such open source team. And I'm like, you know, that team is just one person, right? It's not, can it be a team if it's just one person? I don't, I don't understand. Uh, anyway, it seems like if you're, if you're a team of one, you're probably talking to yourself frequently. So maybe I am a team of one. Anyway. <laughs> I'm not crazy, really. <laughs> so I want to talk about raw performance, measuring raw performance of a particular algorithm. Uh, and Davey touched on some of this stuff earlier today, so hopefully I can move through it quickly because I only have like 12 minutes left. Uh, I like to use this library called Benchmark IPS, and I'm going to compare this to the standard library benchmark tool. Standard library benchmark tool looks something like this, where we say like, okay, create a benchmark, run n sometime around some particular function. We run that function n times, uh, and then it tells us how long it took to run that function n times. The problem, though, is when you're writing a benchmark like this, you're like, well, how big should n be? You don't know what that should be, and oftentimes you'll run a benchmark and the output will look something like this, and you're like, wow, my code is crazy fast. It took like zero time. Uh, so probably what this is saying is probably your n wasn't big enough, but you don't know how big to make that n. And that's where Benchmark IPS comes in. And I think that Benchmark IPS is very, very handy this way. You just say, OK, give it a block of code. And it runs that code as fast as it can uh, in five seconds. So it's like, OK, how many times can I run this particular block in five seconds? And it reports to you in iterations per second. So the higher the iterations per second, the better the algorithm is, or the better that code is. So for example, here we have two, two benchmarks here. One is accessing a set, and one is accessing a list. And we, both, we all know which one is going to be faster here. 
uh, but you can see that the output, see the output here, it says like those are the iterations per second. Uh, the set include was some, I don't know, big number per second, and the array was much smaller. Uh, so with iterations per second, higher is better. So the other cool thing is that this provides a standard, standard deviation, so like when you're doing stuff, you know, you're running your benchmarks, and obviously you're like listening to Rebecca Black on YouTube, and you've got iTunes going at the same time, and probably there's some Netflix as well. Well, that's going to cause some standard deviations in your code or in your benchmarking uh, script, so you'll see those standard deviations there. And that's handy for you to know, like, well, okay, this algorithm will run so many times per second, plus or minus a particular standard deviation, and you want to get that standard deviation as low as possible. Uh, so, <clears throat> if we compare that to, if we can, I, I want to cover another thing with benchmark is like, if you're doing this, this particular example, we have a hash and a set, and we say, okay, we're going to do set include, and we're also going to do hash include, and you think, okay, well, a set include and a hash include, those should be approximately the same, right? A set is probably implemented in terms of a hash. So accessing between these two should be about the same amount of time. But if we run this code using the standard library benchmark, we might see an output that looks like this, and we'll see that, well, the set access is slightly faster than the hash access. This may, this, this may happen. Now, if we run this test again with benchmark IPS to see how quickly we can do in five seconds, we'll see our output looks like this. I'm not going to make you read those. We'll look at a nice graph. The graph looks like this, and we can see that set access is actually slower. It's lower than doing hash access. And actually, the reason is because, the reason for that is because set actually does wrap up a hash, so there are other method calls involved. So when you do set include, it's proxying methods over to the hash, the underlying hash implementation, so it's slightly slower. This probably won't actually matter in the grand scheme of things, but this is just an example of how uh, the standard library benchmark could lie to you. Uh, the other reason I like using these tools is for black box testing. Black, spot, uh, black box testing, like many times, I, so I have a confession to make. When I'm working on Rails, many times I actually have no idea how any of it works. This is, this is true, I've been working on it. I might be the number one committer. Remember, many of those are reverts. Um, but I don't know what's going on, and I'll use benchmarking tools to try and figure it out. So for example, let's say we have two cache implementations. So we're doing cache access on both of those, and we want to measure that. Uh, we want to see how fast these accesses, or how fast an access works when the cache size grows. So we can collect all the reports from Benchmark IPS. We can say, like, okay, I want to populate the cache to size 10, 100, 1,000, 100,000, do a report. We can grab that report, grab the report down here, and compile all this data, which I'm compiling into a CSV. So I take all of those reports turn them into a CSV. I, do, I change that to do seconds per iteration because I actually care about how long each iteration takes. So then I multiply that by 10,000 and say, well, I want to know how long 10,000 iterations takes, and then I'm going to graph that. So I turn that into a CSV, throw that into numbers, and I can see what the graph of that looks like. And you can see along the x-axis there, that's the number of elements involved. Along the y-axis is the amount, of time that, the amount of time that it took for 10,000 iterations. And we can see that that blue one there stays linear, and that green one, or the blue one stays constant, and the green one goes linear, or possibly, uh, possibly square, we're not sure. Um, but it's actually linear if you go look at the, if you go look at the actual implementation. This graph makes sense because one of these is implemented with a hash, which we know lookups will be constant time, and one of these is implemented with an array, which we know will be linear time. And where I use this with real life, a real world example is routes and rails. I wanted to understand as a routing table, does the size of the routing table impact how fast it takes to generate an A tag? So I said, all right, let's create, let's create a bunch of routes. We'll draw some resources. This is an example with one, one route. So I did it again with 10. I timed it, did it again with 10, did it with 100, did it with, a, with 1,000, and then graphed how long it took to generate a link for each of, those, each of those sizes. And if you look at that, I actually went all the way out there, and we see that we get about a linear. It's, it looks weird. We have a large standard deviation, but along the x-axis is the number of routes involved, y-axis is time per link to, and you can see it's about linear. So we know that adding more routes to the routing table does not impact how long it takes to generate a link to. Now, the next thing I wanted to understand was, does the length of the route impact a link to? So how long that href is going to be, does that impact how long it'll take to generate an a tag? In order to do that, I wrote another benchmark that said, okay, I'm going to match against get slash 
uh, a. So right here we have um, get slash a, and then maybe get slash a a, get slash a a a a a, et cetera, et cetera. So we do a length of one, uh, a length of 10, a length of 100, et cetera, et cetera. And if we plot that and look at the, Look at that performance, we'll see again along the x-axis is how many, how many slashes were in that link, and along the y-axis is the amount of time that it took to see that, or to generate that link to. And you can see as we grow the number of segments, the amount of time it takes to generate an A tag gets longer. So we can say probably that implementation has some sort of uh, linear data structure, maybe there's an array involved, we're not sure exactly. So now that we understand where our time is being spent, or now that we understand what, exactly is slow, how can we figure out where our time is spent? And the way I do that is with a tool called StackProf, and this is, a, this is a sampling profiler. And the way that we use this is we say, okay, run this code inside of a block and it'll sample every so many seconds. Where are we? What call frame are we at? And the idea behind that is that the longer you spend inside a particular function, the more likely it is that that sample will find that, will see that you're there. Right, so this dumps out a text file, and we can just say, okay, show me the text, or it dumps out a data file, and we can use this command line tool to dump out what that actual stack trace is, and this is the, this is the output I got from it, and you'll see at the very top there, that's where we're spending the most time, it's in this method called URL4, we're spending 20, 26% of our time there, so that's where we wanna focus our efforts on doing, uh, on doing performance improvements. The next thing I want to understand is the amount of objects that we're generating. I use gc.stat to do that. So I say, tell me how many allocations have been allocated in the system. This says, this returns a value to me that is the number of allocations that have happened in the entire system ever. So it's a, it's a number that's always increasing. So what I did is I said, okay, find, find an object from active record, tell me, tell me the number of objects that have been allocated in the system. So warm up, warm up our cache, get the number of objects allocated, do our actual benchmark n times, get the number of objects that were allocated after that, subtract the two and divide by n, and then we know how many objects per run we did. So a real world example where I'm using this is with figuring out where our objects are being allocated with regard to views. So in order to do this, I generated a fake request and I sent that to our, to our application. So we have, this is doing um, requests against book slash new and it's doing it for a count number of times. So right here we set up the rack environment. This is the hash that we just send to our middleware, that hash of stuff that I totally, totally hate. Uh, count up the number of allocated objects, exactly the same thing we saw on the previous slide. And if we graph this between 4.0 stable, 4.1 stable, and master, our test results look like this. They're actually going down big time. But there's one thing I want you to notice about this graph is that the lower left-hand corner actually starts at 2,000. So this is an example of how to lie with graphs. Uh, if we set that lower left-hand corner to zero, the graph looks more like this, and then we, we are sad because it's not very much. But you have to realize that even though this graph does not look very good, it's actually a 19% reduction in objects since 4.0 stable and actually a 14% reduction in objects since 4.1 stable. Now, this is interesting because we can see the overall number of objects that are allocated for your system, but you, you wanna know, like, Aaron, how many strings are being allocated? Oh, shit, three minutes, okay. <laughs> uh, allocation tracer, this is the tool that I'm using for that. Uh, so allocation tracer will tell you what objects are being allocated. It, it counts up forever and ever like our previous one, but it tells you the types. So here's, a, here's an example, we run this a thousand times, we get the output from that, and we'll see that we generated a thousand strings, a thousand arrays, and a thousand hashes. This output is actually much longer, but I trimmed it up for the slides. So um, I wanted to look at spe speeding up helpers and reducing object allocations reducing object allocations inside of our helpers, and I did this by profiling request and response, which we saw previously, this test I showed previously, but this time we're generating that hash again, but we're using stack prof this time in order to figure out where we're doing object allocations, and if you look at this, look at the output, you'll see that safe buffer initialize is using up 9% of our CPU time, and I wanna talk a little bit about safe buffer, uh, so I wanted to see where is safe buffer initialized being called, and the way I use this is with the TracePoint API. So look up TracePoint. Uh, it ships with Ruby. TracePoint, this, says, this code says, okay, fire this particular block anytime there is a C call, which is a call on a C, C method, or anytime there's a normal Ruby call. Fire this block, and inside this, I only care about stuff that's being fired on active safe, or active support safe buffer, where the method is initialized. 
So I get access to the call stack so I can see exactly where those are being called. And you can see down here at the bottom we have two particular calls. And the output of this program shows me that one of those is actually inside the HTML safe method. Okay, this will become interesting later, hopefully. The other one is inside of the main function where we saw that we just allocated that straight. And the, where this is actually happening inside of Rails, if we look at that call stack and this is inside of the tag option method, this tag option method is used inside, like, say, form tags, anywhere where we generate uh, attributes of the tags. So, like, you know, href equals whatever, or method equals post, any of those places, we're using this particular hel helper. Now, where it was actually happening is right here, this erbutil.h. So I want to talk a little bit about sanitization. Oh, God, I'm not going to make it in time. Let's go quickly. So safe, we're going to talk about safe buffers. Uh, this is an ordinary string. This is HTML safety handling in Rails. So a normal string is not HTML safe. We consider that not to be safe. Uh, if you tag it, if you say .html safe, we return to you a safe buffer that actually just tags it. So HTML safe just tags it, saying that this is, this is safe. We consider this to be something that's OK to write out over the wire. So erbutils.h, if you look at the implementation of that, what it would do is say, OK, we're going to g sub out. If it's, if it's not HTML safe, we're going to make it HTML safe with this g sub. And then we're going to call HTML safe on that. And what this actually did is the g sub generated a new string object, and the HTML safe generated another string object. So we're actually creating two strings per object whenever we call this method, or two strings per call. So if you look at tag options, we call erbutils.h, we assign that to value, and then look at what the value, where that value variable is used. That value variable is actually just interpolated back into a freaking string. Which means that what's happening here is we're going from a string to a string to a safe buffer back to a string again. So this safe buffer is a waste. So we wanted to eliminate it. The way we did that is extract this method, uh, extract this into another method. We have an unwrapped HTML escape, which does not tag the string. It just escapes it. Does the G sub, so we only have one string allocated. And then we create this extra one down here, so we stay backwards compatible. So we update our callers. Now this will only create one string, and we get interpolated down here again. So now we're just doing string to string to string. And this, see, this may seem very sad, except that it saved over 200 allocations per request. So we run this benchmark again, again with books new, uh, for a certain, amount, certain amount of time. And we look at this place, I wanted to look at the types of objects and where they were being allocated. And if we look at that, uh, this is a breakdown by type, string, array, hash. We'll see there 40 stable, 41 stable, and master, and we're actually dropping with all of these. Again, it doesn't look super impressive, but remember, 19% reduction, 14% reduction. And again, your mileage may vary. Shouldn't that be kilometer? Shouldn't we be using the metric system? Anyway, so we've reduced all of this. The reason it'll vary is because this depends on how your ERB templates are used. Um, I have like a lot of slides left. I'm not sure if I should continue. Ben, keep going. Should I keep going? OK. I, I just want all of you to get your money's worth. Seriously. <laughs> like I'm, not, I'm not always speaking at Cascadia. And you don't live in my house. My wife, my wife hears all of this every day. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I want to look at string object reduction. I wanted to do this even more. And if you look at this, in Ruby, we have mutable strings. And what this means is, so if you look at run this code five times here, and you say print out foo.object ID, you'll see every time we execute that block, it actually allocates a new string, even though that string never changed each time we go through it, right? And what's cool is in Ruby 2.1, there's actually a new, there's a new optimization where if you freeze a string literal, it's actually constant. We don't allocate a new object. So if you run, if you say foo.freeze and print out the object ID, you'll see it's always the same thing. Now, if we look at implementations of ERB templates, so this is an ERB template. This is the code that it actually generates. I want all of you to read this very closely. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, so anyway, if we zoom in on part of this compiled template, we'll see we have this, this method here that we call safe buffer append, and we're appending some string, and that string came from, this, from your ERB template. It's an HTML literal. This is an HTML literal that came in your template. But what's interesting is the HTML template, the template literals can't change. Those strings cannot change. You can't get access to them. They cannot be modified. So we added freeze added freeze to that, and now we just freeze those HTML literals. 
Again, this brought down, this brought down our uh, allocations for requests drastically. The next thing I wanted to do is speed up, speed up output. Uh, and I have to warn you, this is a work in progress. Um, the way that we're speeding up, this, this stuff hasn't actually landed in master yet, but it is on my laptop. Hopefully my laptop does not burn up. Um, uh, it's all up here, right? That's fine, it's fine. Uh, so the way, that I sped, the way that I was speeding up output is using the law of Demeter, but I think that this is a weird name. I think it should actually be the suggestion of Demeter, because it's not actually a law. You can't get arrested for it if you violate it, except here in the United States where you can get arrested for it. <laughs> So one thing I was wondering, though, is if you get arrested for violating the law of Demeter, does that make you an arrested developer? <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> uh, when I thought of that, it blew my mind. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway. Um, so <laughs> law of Demeter, I think law of Demeter is interesting. I don't actually understand any of the explanations of it. What I think about it as is, it's not about the dots, it's about the types that you handle in your functions. So it doesn't matter how many dots you have in your functions, it matters what types you handle inside of your function. And the fewer types that you handle, the faster and easier your code is. Uh, now, again, let's take a look, very close look at this compiled template. Very close, read that closely. Uh, zoom in again. Here we have our old friend, this safe, safe append, where we're adding a string literal, again, HTML literal, that cannot be modified. And what's interesting about this is that it's generated. Remember, it's generated by our ERB compiler. And if we go look at the output buffer object, this output buffer, and we look at the implementation of safe, safe append, let's take a look at it. This is, this is the implementation of safe append equals. And the first thing I notice about this, this happens to me all the time when I'm working on, working on Rails stuff, is why? Why are we checking for nil? This doesn't make any sense. The ERB compiler guarantees that that method call is gonna be called with a string. We know in advance. That's being taken care of for us. We don't need to know about dot, whether or not it's a nil, right? So that line can go, it can go. So we're not dealing with nils anymore. This function dealt with nils and it dealt with strings. But now we're saying, okay, we'll, we'll say super and we're calling 2s, value 2s on that thing. Let's make sure that stupid thing's a string. It's gotta be a string, 2s it. Really, really a string. But remember, the ERB compiler guaranteed it was a string for us. We know in advance it's a string. So we can get rid of that 2s. We know, we know we're just dealing with 2s. Now, now the value, we know that calling super with a value, we can just get rid of that, that goes away. So, because we're just passing all those parameters up, and now, now that method can just be implemented like that. That could just go away. <laughs> so this is how you speed up Rails. <laughs> so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure whether or not that was a law of the meter, or why that code was actually, actually was the way it was. I think it may have been uh, defensive programming, but my jokes wouldn't have worked if I had called it that. So I think uh, what we have to do when we're dealing with this stuff is we have, to, we have to limit the types that we're dealing with. It's very powerful for us to say, like, in this particular function, I only handle strings. I only handle strings. Now, if we look at the superclass, we'll see that, okay, well, the superclass passes in. We have to check whether or not the self is HTML safe. But we know that... That output, body, that output body can't be mutated, and the only way that our output buffer cannot be HTML safe is if somebody mutates it. So this, only, this conditional only happens on mutations. This conditional is only ever true when that output buffer is mutated. But how can you, out, how can you mutate the output buffer? I guarantee none of you know how. Well, I hope you don't. <laughs> Otherwise, I have broken your code. <laughs> Who mutates the output buffer? I think nobody does that. So I think we could actually reduce the superclass down to this and increase our, increase our um, performance this way. So I think if we eliminate our objects, the first thing that we need to do, we need to do for in speeding up our code is eliminating our objects. Remember, I have no idea who said this, but no code is faster than no code. Really. Limit the types that we're dealing with. Fewer types that we deal with equals less code. Less code equals faster code. The other thing is report performance issues to us on the Rails core team, please open tickets. And you don't need to say like, you don't need to say like, Aaron, uh, my app is super slow. Just say like, Aaron, this, this thing, I, I think that finding a record from active record should be faster. It's too slow now. Like we need to know this particular stuff because 
we don't really have a good, uh, I'm not sure how to do this. We don't have a good uh, suite for preventing against performance regressions, so please, please help anybody if you can. But if you ever see any performance issues, report them to us. If you say, like, if you see something in, I don't know, in Node or some other framework where it's very fast compared to something we do in Rails, report that. Say, hey, this other framework do does something that's equivalent to what we do in Rails. Why is there there's faster? It's probably a bug. And before you decide to freeze all of the strings, <laughs> measure, 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 measure. Seriously. Don't go around freezing all the strings in your code base. Your coworkers will hate you. Only do it in places where it's actually a bottleneck, where you're actually seeing performance issues. So to conclude this, I know that I'm over. Uh, Rails 4.2 will be the fastest Rails ever. Um, thank you. That is all.